name's John Gray, and I'm the uh, co-director of the UCL Centre for Applied Linguistics, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the first talk of the spring term. And I'm delighted that we have with us uh, Professor Emma Dafoth um, today from the uh, Complutense University in Madrid. And Emma is currently a visiting scholar at UCL, and we've been working together over the last term on a special issue of the ELT Journal on ELT and English medium education in multilingual university settings. Uh, the special issue will be out later in the spring, and it has contributions from Lee Wei, from Jin, uh, and from Sean Priest. So the centre is actually very well represented in the special issue. Emma's work, as many of you will know, is concerned with the roles of languages in education, both in schools and in higher education. And her most recent book, published by Palgrave Macmillan in 2020 and co-written with Uta Schmidt, is titled Road Mapping English Medium Education in the International University. And that's actually what Emma's going to talk about uh, this afternoon. Emma will talk for about 50 minutes and then talking you can you can make comments or ask questions using the chat facility and then at the end be able to address all or as many of those as is possible any of those comments and questions um in half hour or so so welcome emma it's great to have you with us um i'll now hand over to you and you can with i know what's going to be a very interesting talk Thank you, John. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Thank you, Jim, for inviting me too. Thank you for hosting me at um, University College London, where, as, as you said, I, I'm spending, you know, this, this first um, um, school year, school term. Um, so um, what I'm going to do today is, as John has explained, I'm going to talk about English medium education in, um, in these multilingual university settings. And I'm gonna be focusing on a framework that um, we have developed, my colleague Uta Smith from Vienna and myself, and that some of you might be familiar with. So apologies for repeating myself in, in some points, but I, I do hope that there'll be new information here for you um, and interesting um, conversations that will follow and questions that will follow, okay? So I'm gonna start right away, but as I say, please um, ask any questions, comments, either through the chat or later on, okay? I'm gonna try and summarize quite a lot of um, information, but I do hope it's, it's clear. So um, the outline, um, basically what I've done is organize this uh, presentation in, in four uh, uh, points, which is English um, medium education, what is in focus here. Then I want to talk about what kind of label, what kind of term are we uh, going to be using? What should we call it? Then I'll talk about how can we uh, picture it how can we actually examine it or describe it through this road mapping framework, and then how to apply it, which is um, going to be done through um, focusing on three major areas, which are how to describe particular settings, could be countries, uh, could be institutions. I'll talk about two, uh, one country in particular, mostly Japan, where road mapping has been used to describe it a little bit about Vietnam. And then I'm gonna talk about my own setting, Complutense University, where um, Amemus has also started to be developed like in many of your countries. And then I'll talk a little bit about teacher professional development, teacher education, if we have the time. Okay, so all this, as I said, would not be possible if it weren't for the uh, valuable collaboration of my colleague, uh, Professor Ute Smith from the University of Vienna. And she is, you know, amemus and road mapping is 50-50. And I think that's what makes it really interesting because we have different uh, settings and different uh, types of expertise that I have made this, this framework really, really uh, interesting and um, multi-layered if you want. So um, I'll start with a little bit of data. 
And I don't know if you're familiar, but because this came out rather recently, you know, this is um, figures that reflect the growing impetus of um, English taught programs. Uh, this comes from study portals. It was um, released uh, in the press, uh, you know, at the end of December 2021, two weeks ago. And it says that 77% of the, um, there's a 77% growth uh, outside the big five um, higher um, education institutions and the big five meaning the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. And I think they also talk about Hong Kong, but you know, big four, big five or big six. And what we, the, the study portals report also say that the, the vast majority of English taught programs are offered within Europe. Uh, but also growing very fast in the Chinese region. Um, countries that stand out in delivering these programs are uh, led by Netherlands, Germany, and China, and many others, but these are quite, you know, uh, stand out quite um, noticeably. And then information from the OECD shows that there is, has been a, an important increase in the number of international students in the world from uh, 1.7 million to uh, 3.9 million in 2018. And these figures are definitely growing as we speak. So this is just to show you the, uh, the scope, the scale, and the recency of uh, EMEMAS of this development, English medium education. So um, what is in focus? When, when people talk, when researchers, uh, decision makers, people in general, even the media talk about EMI, um, there's a kind of common understanding that we're referring to the use of English for instructional purposes in academic subjects other than English. So English, uh, teaching chemistry through English or teaching uh, biology or history, philosophy, whatever. Okay, there is agreement towards that. But then there is enormous disagreement in a number of other aspects, such as, is this happening in non-English dominant contexts or in international learner groups? Or can we actually include now English dominant contexts as could be, for example, the UK, where we have a lot of international students learning through English. So again, there is this, this there is a little bit of, quite a bit of disagreement there. Um, what we do um, know is that there, by definition, if English is used in non-English dominant context, then we would have a bilingual setting, uh, sociolinguistically speaking, but also multilingual if we have international learner groups that bring with them a variety of uh, multilingual repertoires, okay? Um, at the same time, um, are we referring to the tertiary level, higher education? Or are we including other levels of education as some researchers and some studies actually do? And, and um, this is something that is, is still um, under discussion. So what we find when we, when we talk about EMI is that there's enormous diversity, diversity according to learner age, if we kind of concentrate on other levels of education in addition to the, the tertiary one. Um, enormous diversity when it comes to learning experience, to educational expectations in the different levels, uh, when it comes to institutional objectives and aims for teaching through English, or when it comes to the teacher and lecturer identities, which differ um, enormously across educational levels, as, as we know well. So given these um, uh, differences, there are different labels that have been used in the literature, also in, in the policies, and you might be familiar with many of them or, or all of these. Um, the CLIL is a term that has been an uh, educational uh, paradigm, if you want, that's been around for over 20 years now, uh, which stands for Content and Language Integrated Learning, but generally speaking, it is understood that it refers to non-tertiary settings, although it has been used. For example, for, for tertiary, we would uh, refer to integrating content and language in higher education, but there, the integration of content and language is made explicit, unlike in EMI. Um, the term bilingual education has been around for many, many years. 
um, a lot of research coming from the Canadian setting, but but we know that again there are differences in 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 the understanding, dual language education, or the one that we are kind of using today, EMI English medium instruction. So given the complexity of all this, and given the, um, the, the, the different labels that are actually used to address sometimes common issues and sometimes very uh, disparate ones, um, Ute, Smith and myself actually put together the acronym EMIMAS, which refers to English medium education in multilingual university settings. And um, we think that this term is much more, um, accurate when referring to this reality because um, we're referring to the multilingual scenarios in the wider sense because we're including all participants with their multilingual repertoires with different levels of proficiency of course because we're including top-down regulations from institutions or supranational organizations like European Union uh, and, and also bottom-up realities of what is going on in the actual classroom. Um, at the same time, I think we think the term education is more inclusive than instruction because it not only looks at teaching, but it also looks at learning. So uh, we are not only, we're, let's say, uh, portraying um, the, the, the teaching and learning process in a much more interactional and social constructive manner. We include different types of pedagogical approaches, more lecture-centered, more teacher-centered, which are really a reflection of, of higher education settings across the world, and, and different types of education, which can be on-site, online, hybrid, et cetera. Um, but we are exclusive, for example, uh, in amemus because explicitly the term amemus refers to university settings and university settings have a very uh, you know dis distinctive uh, a number of distinctive features like teachers are often uh, mainly or very often researchers they they are bound to research um, students are there on a voluntary basis most of the times uh, they are advanced learners, often from a linguistic point of view and also a conceptual point of view, and internationalization is probably more foregrounded, at least explicitly, in these uh, university settings. So that's why we have coined the term, the, the label, the acronym EMIMAS, because we think it is more a fitting to the kinds of English medium education that is going on in 21st century settings. Okay, so going back to this uh, idea of how can we picture it, the idea is that we are including or we are adopting um, this view of uh, educational ecologies where English in relation to other languages needs to be taken into consideration. And I have um, a summary there, which basically what it means is that, that given uh, English medium education uh, for short, is a very diversified, a very highly situated, multi-layered, complex and dynamic reality. Um, and with this, what we're trying to say, what I'm trying to say is that trying to find general, let's say simplistic sometimes, uh, responses, very global answers to a very global issue can be, um, can be dangerous um, in the sense that trying to identify what is successful EMI across all settings is probably uh, impossible and undesirable because it definitely has different um, interpretations and different contextual factors. So if we say, for example, the combination of a number of um, conditions make successful EMI, this might work in a particular setting, but definitely not in another. Um, and for example, understanding that EMI simply requires language proficiency uh, from the part of the of the teachers or the students is is important. I'm not saying that it's not definitely, but I'm I'm saying that that would be um, too simplistic. That there is a more social linguistic and eco linguistics and even ideological and political issues that need to be taken into consideration. So. Um, with with uh, EMIMAS and road mapping, we're trying to um, emphasize the idea that every situation, because we're talking about education, aren't we? Every situation is different, 
Um, and at the same time, comparisons are simply not possible. But having said this, what I want to um, emphasize, let me see, this moves on, yes. What, I want, what we want to emphasize is that at the same time, we want to move away from this syndrome of you don't understand in the sense that, um, you know, the dialogue would not be possible because people would say, well, the situation, EME situation in Spain is so different to what is going on in Denmark or in Bangladesh that it's simply not comparable. And why we agree with this highly situatedness nature, at the same time, we believe that road mapping is a conceptual framework that can help to overcome this fragmentation in conceptualizations that actually occurred at the beginning of EMI, probably 15 years ago, um, that road mapping can be used as a reference when analyzing particular context, and I'll exemplify in a minute, and that at the same time, it can facilitate multi-sided conversations. And by multi-sided, meaning from different uh, national settings, but we'd all, we could also talk about multi-sidedness from different disciplinary backgrounds um, and so on. Even, even levels uh, like the macro and the micro and the meso level. And all this is taken into account um, high education institutions as very, as very fluid, as very dynamic and, and super diverse uh, settings where uh, students and uh, agents from different backgrounds actually participate. Okay. This is what the uh, road mapping framework um, visually looks like, okay? What we tried to do with this kind of um, figure, some people call it the flower, other people call it the vortex. Basically what we tried to show is a combination of six uh, dimensions. Um, each one of them, the beginning of each one of them corresponds to road mapping. Uh, six dimensions that interplay uh, very uh, dynamically to um, and, and um, configurate this amemus uh, reality. Uh, and as applied linguists, uh, Uth and I as applied linguists, we actually use discourse, discourses as the point of access to each of these dimensions, meaning that we would uh, address, for example, or examine amemus through language policies, through uh, teacher interviews, through classroom data, but language being, well, communication language being the, the access point, okay? What I'm going to do now is actually uh, explain these uh, dimensions. I'll probably won't have time to do it very, very um, carefully because I, I think it's important to, to illustrate how uh, road mapping can be used, but please feel free to ask questions at the end of my, my presentation. So starting with uh, roles of English, the beginning of the acronym, what do we refer to when we talk about roles of English? Well, um, if you have worked with uh, content teachers or people that are not linguists, uh, when one talks about language, you know, uh, the idea that English is English is, is kind of um, there. You know, when, when one says English, we're looking at this monolithic reality where it's a, it's a language uh, and therefore it's uniform. But of course, um, we with roles of English, we're actually referring to functional varieties, not, um, not uh, linguistic varieties. We're looking at how English is used um, um, in these um, higher university settings. So often English has been um, adopts the role of English as a foreign language as I, as I have up here. So the learners will be learning the language um, as, as they are exposed to it or in, in particular classes, which could be ESP or EAP courses. Um, or English can adopt the role of a lingua franca, meaning that it could be the shared uh, means of communication across uh, an international group of students or, or lecturers and English being the common, the common ground, the, the shared language. Or it could be English as an additional language, or also English as an international language that could be included. So the different roles of English 
uh, in relation to other languages. And by other languages, as I said um, earlier on, we're talking about the students, L1s, or other languages, multilingual repertoires that they might bring into the classroom, into their university setting. Um, in addition to um, uh, roles of English, the second dimension is academic disciplines. And basically what we try to uh, describe here is the um, different genres and textual models, different types of uh, textual products and processes that learners engage in when um, uh, dealing, um, when becoming you know, socialized into their respective academic disciplines. And here we have the, the very um, well-known uh, distinction by Newman, Perry, Beecher. There are more updated ones, we are aware of that, but basically what we want to show is that a, a different way of classifying, understanding academic disciplines, uh, which can be done in um, according to the applied or pure nature, or the hard versus soft um, you know, sciences. And again, history, education, or physics have different genres, have different disciplinary literacies that uh, students have to learn and teachers need to uh, teach or expose them to um, so that they reach that, produce that product, let's say. The language management refers to the decisions and regulations on language use. Uh, that are in place, and the, this can be done explicitly or implicitly. This includes also curriculum specifications, okay? Uh, and, and language management can operate at, at various levels, a supranational level, for example, the European Union, a national level, like a ministry, uh, deciding on what kind of language proficiency level students are to have, or at an institutional level, meaning how the universities actually regulate um, entry into university uh, settings, for example, in terms of language proficiency, English in this case. Um, and on the other side, we have agents. So who are the social actors um, engaged in these settings? What kind of, um, what kind of um, form do they adopt? Are we talking about a collective entity? such as uh, a department? Are we talking about individuals as particular lecturers? Are we looking at concrete or abstract entities? And how are these uh, entities operating at the different macro, meso, or micro levels? And of course, um, you know, participants, social agents have different, um, different entities, different identities, if you want, that sometimes come into tension as an individual versus as part of a, a, a collective uh, unit. When we talk about practices and processes, we're talking about the, uh, the teaching and the learning activities that construct a MEMIS and are also constructed by MEMIS realities. That is, what kind of methodological uh, changes need to be included when one is teaching through uh, as English um, as, a mean of, uh, as a means of instruction when it's not the student's L1? Are we adapting the, the kind of teaching that is going on in some way? Are we not? But obviously there, there need to be pedagogical adaptations. What kind of assessment practices are we implementing? Again, are we focusing on content only, on language? Are we integrating both? What kind of impact does that have on student learning, on teachers' uh, instruction, et cetera? And what kind of teaching formats and materials are being um, used? In, in these particular settings. Um, and when it comes to internationalization and globalization, I'm, well, I'm quoting here Knight, uh, there are more updated, but that's kind of a classical um, quotation about internationalization, which refers to the process of integrating an international, intercultural, or global dimension into the purpose functions or delivery of post-secondary education. And I know that there are uh, more recent definitions by, for example, um, oh God, the name, I don't have it there, but I mean, um, Heller and uh, yes, that actually talk about the process of purposeful integration because internationalization does not happen um, as such if there's not a purposeful um, uh, Belen and Jones, that was the, the name. 
Um, and then the complex interplay of global conditions on local context is Robertson's definition of globalization. So the impact of the global on the local and the local on, on the global understandings. Okay, I know that I've gone very quickly through these um, through these dimensions, but but maybe some of you have have read about them, heard them. Again, I'm open to to questions. So what I want to do here is exemplify, as I say, applications of road mapping. So um, road mapping has been used to describe EME in particular regions or countries and across settings too. It can be used or has been used to inform EME policies in particular, again, countries or institutions. Uh, also for developing um, ME teacher education programs. Again, I'll exemplify in a minute. Also for designing um, research. Um, and this is what we're doing at present with, with, with our project shift that we're actually focusing using road mapping to identify uh, the dimensions that we want to foreground for analyzing particular practices uh, and also for reinterpreting data. And this is interesting, this probably this last um, example is less uh, known to, to you, um, but you can find some examples in the book that Ute and I uh, published. Um, and basically the idea of reinterpreting data that was um, collected, gathered before road mapping, for example, Ute did it with her data. And she found that some of the interpretations that she had uh, developed for some of the findings um, actually gained depth by, by using the different dimensions that road mapping is um, presenting, is using. So interesting food for thought there to reinterpret existing uh, data. Okay. Um, so let's begin with uh, a little bit, a little exemplification of describing amoebas in regions or countries. I'm going to use the example of the book published by uh, Annette Bradford and and um, and Brown in uh, 2018. You might be familiar with it in Japan, English medium instruction in Japanese higher education, and the introductory chapter provides a synthesis of insights across studies. And in some, this is what they say about um, EMI in Japan. They say that EMI is booming and, and still developing. This is 2018, four years ago, that English is a vehicle for communicating academic content in various disciplines, and that EMI is not uh, yet fully embraced, but is, is acting as, a, as an impetus for change in, in pedagogy in, in these in university settings, okay? And while these um, uh, findings are interesting, uh, the interesting thing in the book is later to go into how with the use of road mapping, uh, more nuanced, more in-depth, more informative uh, understandings of amoebas can actually happen. And I'm just gonna give you some examples, probably not all of them because it would take um, too much time, but I, I kind of will comment on, on some of these. For example, it's quite interesting to see that when it comes to the roles of English, that is the, um, the, the functional uses of English at the, at the university setting, that um, there's a dominance of EAP and English as a foreign language um, approaches, roles, and there's very little um, English as a lingua franca in Japan, at least in the studies uh, included in this in this book. Uh, basically, because a lot of the, um, the, the students are Japanese students, uh, and therefore less international students, and Japanese is also used as a, as a medium of instruction and uh, as, uh, as a lingua franca. Okay, let me go to the next one. Um, when it comes to academic disciplines, like in many other settings, social sciences seem to predominate, uh, but also engineering and natural sciences are growing steadily and ESP and EAP is not actually integrated in this EME uh, courses. That is the teachers teaching in this EME courses, content teachers are not actually uh, integrating uh, socialized, uh, disciplinary literacies, the students' disciplinary literacies. 
that is kind of done aside. Um, there are very few language policies, and if they are, they're kind of vague and not very developed. Maybe in 2022, things have changed that we do have to acknowledge, admit. And English is, for the most part, kept invisible. It is um, um, not really mentioned as English, but kind of foreign language without referring to English. And the focus is mostly on teaching, um, the role of English in teaching and, and um, not in admin, for example, administration uh, roles. Okay, uh, the, the, when, when it comes to agents, the ministry seems to be a key factor in the Japanese setting. Uh, there was a very big, there has been a very big um, movement, a strategy, a ministerial strategy, uh, and as a sign of, you know, competitiveness of Japanese higher education. Um, and many of the higher institutions, higher education institutions are focusing on the local market, on Japan. Um, and agency, as we said before, is limited to teaching and focusing largely on the Japanese, on the home students rather than the international students, those that come. Uh, when it comes to uh, practices and processes, um, I found this one particularly interesting because there seem to be like two EMI models in, in, in parallel. Um, in the sense that the um, there are kind of teacher-centered versus student-centered models. So a teacher-centered model, which is more kind of lecture-based and more seems to be developed most extensively by the um, uh, Japanese lecturers in a, in a more traditional way, whereas the student-centered model is developed um, more frequently by the... Um, by the international, by the EFL teachers, and also international English speaking uh, uh, teachers that come, that are hired for these EMI courses. So it's quite interesting to see two uh, different um, models and two pedagogical approaches there. Okay, when it comes to internationalization and globalization, we also have the tensions between the global and the local uh, drivers. So we have different parallel structures and opposing forces. So attention to the local uh, in order to keep the, the Japanese, uh, you know, curricular teaching style uh, ethos versus the international westernized. Uh, and this has a representation also in, in some of the literacies and how they are approached. Um, Howard Brown talks about a hybrid model where, where the students um, either reproduce Anglo-Saxon models in writing, for example, with um, some Japanese uh, features, rhetorical features, if you wish, or purely, purely Japanese rhetorical models in, written in English. So that's a very interesting situation there of um, hybridity. Okay, and another um, country that is actually that I know of that has actually used um, road mapping to to frame their setting is the volume. I think it's coming out this year. I know it's coming out. I don't think it's out yet in Vietnam uh, by Min Fun and Jenny Barnett. And basically, um, they they use a top down approach to frame Vietnamese EMI setting combined with road mapping. It's very interesting to see how they. They focus on agency, but agency is framed against the other five uh, road mapping dimensions. So roles of English, academic disciplines, internationalization, and so on and so forth. So it's quite interesting to, to get this um, vision of uh, Vietnamese EME with the, with the use of road mapping. I actually read the book and I, I wrote the, the foreword. It was very interesting because I, I literally know nothing of Vietnam. And I wish I knew more and I could go and visit, but it was very, very clear with the use of road mapping to actually um, explain a very interesting and complex setting. Okay, um, for managing amemus policies, what I'm going to do here is talk briefly about my own setting, Complutense University in, in Madrid, in Spain. And if we have time, a little bit about future development and otherwise I'll just take your questions. Okay, so this is my university. This is the rectorate building on a sunny day. It's uh, what we call a mega university, very big, the biggest in, in Spain, um, 
but of course there are many other big universities in in the world but and also Vienna interestingly is quite quite similar in terms of size so we we share some of these features um we had a late official arrival to EME um late meaning um 2014 official but they were bottom-up initiatives that go back to the beginning of the 2000s, like in other parts of the world. And they were pioneering EME faculties, economics and business, as in many other settings, psychology as well, computer sciences and education. And now we have um, many others that are following at different, uh, different pace. Okay, so at the time, um, I was actually working at the... Uh, rectorate, I was kind of um, advising the international relations um, unit. Um, and um, I didn't actually use road mapping as, as, um, as a roadmap, but because it was actually developing at the time when I was advising, but they kind of worked in parallel. And, and the situation that I was living at my own university was a kind of feeding into the model and the model was feeling feeding into the uh, internationalization policy that was developing we were developing there so it's quite interesting this kind of um, action research taking place okay so in stage one uh, the dimensions prioritized were basically internationalization because um, at least in Complutense but I believe in many other settings internationalization is the key strategy and then EME comes in to um, favor, to support, to cater for this strategy. So internationalization is uh, foregrounded in globalization, language management, because we were designing and putting in writing um, a language management policy that had not uh, been developed before. It was very much um, invisible and um, you know, um, de facto, but not in written form. And then we were focusing on a particular set of agents who were the teachers at the time, because they were the ones that needed most support to teach through English as something so new. Okay, and uh, basically what I want to show with this is that we moved from this idea of internationalization as mobility, only mobility, um, to understanding internationalization in a more nuanced manner. The, the, the notions of internationalization at home that you are probably familiar with or internationalization of the curriculum came into play and the teachers working in these settings now understand the differences very clearly and the uh, admin personnel do too and even the decision makers, believe it or not. And these has language implications like adapting classroom discourse, or the choice of intercultural examples in the teaching or attention to differences in academic cultures. For example, do we teach history in the same way in Spanish um, or do we do it in English or do we teach history following a particular Spanish model um, and, and in Austria they'll follow an Austrian model or whatever that might be. Um, when it comes to language management, we know that there are many policies around at different levels at a macro, meso and micro, and that these have an impact on, on um, you know, I was gonna say one another, but in a way they do. I mean, they kind of feed into one another in a, in a kind of scale uh, mode. And this one that you have at the bottom is our plan for internationalization that we developed back in, in 2016. Okay, um, I won't say more about that because we wouldn't finish. <laughs> So when it comes to agents, we, we find different levels in, in our institution. We know that universities are highly hierarchical structures. Um, Complutense is no, no different. So there are different agents involved at the macro level. We have the rectorate. They centralize the policies in my institution. They're responsible for accreditation, incentives, and professional development. Uh, at the meso level, we have faculties, 26 faculties in my university, and they are the ones actually responsible for implementation. Of course, this depends very much on their human resources, on the status of English within their disciplines, and also on their beliefs. So, for example, in business and economics, English is goes without discussion, whereas in other areas like philosophy, there is there's huge debate. I'll talk about that in a minute. And at the micro level, 
We have the, the department of lecturers that have or some autonomy to implement it or not. And the lecturers as actors are responsible for putting it into practice, but have very little agency often. And I've put on the side student and admin staff because when it comes to uh, deciding on many things, they've had very little voice, okay? Although things are changing because uh, we realize that without the student voice and the admin support, um, EMEMA's English medium programs do not go much further, do they? So we need to incorporate these, these agents into the, into the equation. Stage two, um, the, the, the dimensions prioritized were roles of English, the academic disciplines and the, the different activities, the practices and processes that took place, take place in the classroom and in the university in general, okay? Now, Again, what we have found, because I'm actually following my many of these lecturers now as a researcher, not as a, not as a advisor to the rectorate, what we found is that there has been a kind of gradual change, and that's why I'm using this, this arrow, to show um, a gradual change, a shift from English-only practices, and we call them mm, Paradoxically, we call these degrees in, in the Spanish setting grados bilingües, bilingual degrees, but they're literally English only, okay? So we're moving from this English only to a little bit of translanguaging, especially um, when it comes to interpersonal um, experiences, exchanges, uh, or students in classroom interaction. But when it comes to exam situations, in most cases, it's English only. But there has been, especially with the teachers that we work with, with in the professional development courses, a concern for developing biliteracy in the students, English and Spanish, and also to regard EME as an opportunity to reflect on, on what was, you know, on longstanding teaching practices and, and innovate in teaching uh, pedagogies. Academic disciplines, again, quite an interesting um, mixed bag here. Um, obviously, and I would think this is natural, of course. Um, so it's most extended in the social sciences, as in many other places, um, less extended in the sciences in my institution, but I've noticed that there are differences in other settings, probably because it is already assumed. Are we assuming that, I don't know, students or lecturers that teach in chemistry are uh, already familiar with English because they, um, they read, they do all the research in English? Um, and, and not only that, I mean, the, the, many of these students are requested to complete their PhD or dissertations in English, either totally or partially. So there's, there's quite, quite a mismatch in, you know, what is expected and what is offered in some of these settings. And there is less representation in the humanities. Uh, again, a question here is, is, are we, is it because we're regarding language um, uh, and, and the language related to the construction of disciplinary knowledge rather than just a, a medium? So it's quite interesting food for thought. And then there's, there's quite a little bit of debate in some of these areas in the humanities about the fear of disciplinary language lost in the, in the L1 domain loss, okay? And this is something that is going around in, in many circles beyond competency. Okay. Um, when it comes to the roles of English, we find that there are different variety, different roles here. Um, students are accepted based on their English proficiency, and therefore we're looking at um, English as a foreign language. English language development is expected, but again, it's expected, but not, um, not um, measured, if you want, uh, not proved. So they enter with a B2 level, that's compulsory, but no one actually... Um, assesses how they leave the degree after four years of teaching, of learning through English. So interesting research there. Lecturers, um, English is not linked to any particular variety. So you might have teachers that because they were trained in, in the US will speak American English, US English, or would speak, uh, again, there is a, a combination of, of um, varieties there and none of them are a kind of um, preferred Maybe the American, maybe we, we would have to discuss that. And then ESP in the form of glossaries and technical vocabulary. Um, English is an international language um, for employability, a differentiated curriculum versus 
other students that do it through Spanish, and lecturers see English in most cases as um, a, a kind of a, a springboard for professional development and uh, internationalization. Um, English as a lingua franca with international students is regarded um, as more and more meaningful and authentic use of English and Spanish as language for internationalization. So we see that there is a, a very interesting uh, representation of roles of English in, in our particular setting and in business more specifically. Okay, um, for preparing a MIMAS teacher development, um, we have used uh, road mapping again, um, initially in a kind of um, uh, implicit manner. And, and as we were developing it uh, more theoretically, the, the findings from our research have actually come into the, um, into the teacher professional programs that we teach on a yearly basis. We call our course Intercom, uh, 30 working hours. Um, it's run twice uh, a year, face-to-face -face and online in a hybrid mode. Lecturers are required to certify a C1 level, and we're focusing on oral communication strategies. This is what we've been doing, but again, because of this dynamic um, you know, reality, we're finding that we're moving into, into other needs that the teachers are uh, manifesting, like you know, disciplinary literacies in, in English, for example. Um, multidisciplinary, meaning that we have teachers from all different settings, all different faculties. Uh, it's voluntary, again, a difference with uh, respect to other settings. And the assessment is based on a micro-teaching practice at the end of the, of the course. Okay, and how is road mapping um, used to describe the setting? I don't think I'm going to have time, but basically I can respond to that later. But just to show you that it's um, reflection on disciplinary language differences in the oral mode. So to give you an example, um, the people working in business have actually agreed after a lot of discussion, because when you talk to, to, to some content teachers, at least the ones in my setting about genres and textual uh, models, they kind of look at you and what, what do you mean? Are there different types of textual models? And this might sign, sound a little bit surprising, but this is what we have found. So, but, but we did find in business that a lot of the uh, genres or what, a common genre that is uh, developed across um, all, you know, the, the whole uh, degree is um, case studies. They do a lot of case studies with uh, in business. So they talk about a particular company and they, um, you know, they develop a case and they present them. There's a lot of oral uh, mode uh, developed with students more than written. And again, what we find is that the lecturers' um, original roles, competences are becoming more and more complex and, and the content experts are finding that they need to develop uh, more the pedagogical competence. And I won't go into this because it's probably a little bit, much, but I can answer questions. So road mapping has enabled participants to raise pedagogical awareness and favor gradual changes. It is um, reflecting and developing pedagogical content knowledge it has helped and enables the participants to receive specific guidelines on how to teach in EMEMAS. So conclusions, and this is my last slide. Um, road mapping, the road mapping framework is um, dynamic and flexible in its conceptualization, because it can actually look at one particular, uh, or can, can foreground a particular uh, dimension, for example, roles of English, but also always, in relation to all the other um, all the other dimensions. That is, you cannot isolate one dimension from the rest because of course, all these dimensions come into play and um, affect one another. They, are, they interact and they have an impact on one another. The, so this is multi-layered. It's, it's flexible in its application. You can use it for research, for description or for planning a particular policy and then revisiting the policy years later and noticing that there are changes to be made, for example. Also, our road mapping is holistically oriented, meaning that the, the, the sum of its um, 
of its um, components is, um, the total is more than the sum of its components. That's what I wanna say. It's more than the sum of internationalization, roles of English, agents, and so on. It allows for this multi-sided and interdisciplinary collaboration. And this is something that we find very interesting because we hear the voices of practitioners in other settings, like, as I said, business or economics that have a very different view of an experience of their academic disciplines, for example, and it helps to identify aspects which are less developed initially and probably less, less visible, more hidden. And it's discursive because um, in the sense that it gives, gives access to EMEMAS as discursively mediated social action, and it allows for the interplay of the, of the micro bottom, the meso and the macro levels. So we're using this kind of lens. And these are some of the references. And I thank you all for listening very patiently for over 50 minutes, I think, but I think I was quite close. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much <clears throat> for that uh, very stimulating talk, Emma. I've got some questions uh, from you, uh, from, from the group. I mean, people have been making notes as you've um, gone along. If I misrepresent anyone's question, please intervene and say that's not exactly what I wanted to know. Okay, the first question is one that's actually close to my own heart. Uh, <laughs> Emma, as you know, from having worked with me over the last term on our special issue. Um, it's from Betul who asks if knowledge and academic fluency in the L1 uh, is seen as part of what they're calling successful EMI in any context that you know of, because Betul says, if not, we're actually overlooking the hegemonic role of, um, of EMI in education. Yes, absolutely. I mean, this, I go back to the, to the acronym EMEMAS, okay? And if you look at the acronym EMEMAS, we're looking at multilingual, multilingual uh, learners, multilingual users, multilingual settings. So um, absolutely, I agree that the importance is not only to, to, to teach, to learn through English, but always, always in relation to other languages. So when one is, is implementing um, English medium education, I think we, we, all, we would all agree that we want our students we talk about students being able to compete at the global level, but also to be uh, proficient in their own setting, in the local setting, um, where they, you know, have to work, that where they develop. So the idea that uh, with EME, you're not taking away anything, but adding other languages. This doesn't mean that, you know, one would automatically become multilingual and all these, but we're looking at multilingual repertoires as different levels of proficiency, different skills that are operating depending on, that need to be developed depending on, on the students or the teachers, um, you know, immediate setting. You might not need to, to speak the language, but to read it for whatever reason. So definitely we want uh, bilingual, and plurilingual or biliterate uh, learners, absolutely. And this is something that is often not understood in many of these settings. It's, it's a kind of a turn to English only because other languages are regarded as, as you know, coming in the way of, you know, in a, in a very um, cumulative understanding of languages, you know, the more English, the better you will learn. Well, probably not. We're looking at, definitely not, we're looking at other languages as, as resources, multilingual resources that can definitely help in, in that process. Okay, th thanks, uh, Emma. I, I don't know if, if Betul wants to come back and make any comments on that, but that seems a pretty comprehensive um, answer um, on, on that one. Um, I've got two questions from uh, Wenjuan Li. I think you kind of answered the first one really in a way already, Emma. The question mm -hmm. is, is to do with levels of English, really. Um, and the first question was about admission to EMI programs in European universities. Yeah. Um, it seems that in Spain, it's a B2 level, as you said. Is that something that is across the, the European Union or across Europe, or it varies depending on the country? I, I think it varies tremendously. OK, uh, interestingly, B, B2 seems to be, well, B2 is called the threshold level, isn't it? So it's kind of looked at the, at the uh, level for adequate, um, successful EMI, if you want, okay? But again, it's not so simple. 
Um, some years ago in Spain, we actually put together a, a policy from all the different universities. We have 70 different universities in Spain. Um, well, 70 are the public ones, and we have private models too. And we kind of agreed on a B2 level as, um, as a requirement. But then we found that there were, again, important differences um, across uh, regions in Spain and also uh, even across disciplines. So as we said, you know, in some areas, English might be regarded as a must, like business or economics, and not so much in others. So um, B2 seems to be the, the, the general a proficiency level, but there are interesting studies conducted by people that are really working into this, and I, I'm not, not specifically, for example, that say that in addition, I mean, you, you might have um, students with a B1 level. Of course, the higher the level, the better, but, but if you provide enough scaffolding support and pedagogy, you can kind of counterbalance lower levels. And the other way around, if you have um, uh, higher levels of proficiency and very little uh, pedagogy and scaffolding and support, you might find that the students are not so um, successful. Again, because we're dealing with a kind of um, setting in which the students are to uh, understand uh, you know, conceptual uh, knowledge very, very profoundly. And, and it's academic English, as we all know, is a is a foreign language to all of us. Mm. So summarizing, there seems to be general agreement in B2 as a must, as a kind of threshold, but there is enormous diversity depending on the settings. It is true that, the, you know, the, we are finding that students in general in Spain are coming with a higher level because of many, many factors. Uh, extramural English is a big, is a big factor. Uh, Netflix is a big factor, <laughs> but then when we come into um, a university, um, in addition to a, a, a kind of a, a level, other pedagogical and linguistic um, support needs to be supplied. Okay. I, the, the second question is, is, is then really about the about lecturers. I mean, what level, I suppose it's an opinion question, what level do you, do you think is necessary for the L2 English speaker who is an EMI um, lecture in a non-English dominant context, such as China, what would you see as, as the level that's necessary for, for the lecturer? Um, if you can answer that one. I don't think I dare to answer that. Again, how, um, what are we doing in my own setting? Okay, so we kind of agreed on a B2 level for the students and a C1 level for the teacher, understanding that the teacher um, would kind of naturally, logically have a higher level than the than the student. But um, again, um, it's not it's not just a matter of having a particular level. Is 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 knowing how to actually use the language in a use a, a support, some kind of strategies that actually um, enable the lecturer to teach through a foreign language. So you could use translanguaging, you can use scaffolding. I always say to my teachers, to my content teachers, an, a native teacher is not by definition a good teacher, okay? So we kind of um, try to um, uh, take away uh, the, the, the burden of the, you know, the, the higher the level, the best EMI that is going to happen automatically. That is definitely not the case. Of course, higher levels of competence will help, but I don't think we can lose sight of uh, pedagogical practices and, and good materials, for example, that would actually support students in their learning and teachers in their teaching. Mm. That's why we talk about education as much more interactional. Mm, mm, mm. I think that's, now, a, that's, a, that's a very interesting point, I think, that you're making. Um, I, I remember from, from my own experience, like in, in a past life working on on teacher education courses and when we first started taking so-called non-native speaking teachers onto CELTA courses for example which I used to do a long time ago um, mm -hmm. I mean one of the things that became obvious was that people um, with, with, um, with L2 English were often much better teachers um, than, than so-called native speakers 
Um, exactly. I think that's a very interesting point that you're making. Um, just to move on to, <clears throat> to some more questions, because there are lots of them here. Um, the next sort of two questions are from Cindy Chang and from David Palferman. Um, and they're to do really with the flexibility of the road mapping framework. Now, David's just posted another question related to that, so I'll just read it aloud. He says, just a comment, Emma, what you said about not trying to replace the local language is your point of view stroke value system and mine, but road mapping is more of a descriptive framework, right? So there's a question there. And actors in some settings may well have other assumptions. For example, that the local language, oh my goodness, it's just gone, um, but the local language um, uh, is irrelevant or doesn't need support or is inadequate and should be replaced. So I presume he says that framework would describe these various assumptions discourses as they are yeah exactly it's definitely descriptive of course in each setting um the the you know the the the, the contextual factors are probably even you know going to be interpreted differently because uh but i mean road mapping does not want to emphasize obviously we have english in the title english as a medium of education, but as I, you know, we constantly say it's always in relation with two other languages, and even English can only be defined in relation to other languages. So English here is a foreign language, or it's a lingua franca, or it's a combination. So I mean, I think I think the different languages can only be defined in relation to one another. Okay, uh, and um, the 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 framework itself does not carry. Um, you know the the um the weight the burden does not give it then of course people that actually use the framework or decision makers that want to emphasize certain things you know there's always ideology behind everything that we do but it's definitely not inherent in the in the framework itself no not at all okay uh, cindy cindy wants to know how you see roadmap the road mapping framework maybe developing in the future and she wants to know, do you think that there could actually be more dimensions added on, um, you know, in the future and also maybe see some of the existing dimensions cease to be as important as they currently are? That's a very interesting question. Thank you, Cindy. Cindy is actually contributing to the um, to a to a book that we're actually um, editing, Ute and myself and Cindy is one of the contributors. And in which we actually look at um, different studies that have used uh, road mapping, and it's quite interesting because um, um, you know the the authors themselves have actually um, used uh, the framework very differently, and and one of the objectives was to not only describe that but to look at to adopt a critical stance. So some 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 authors find that certain dimensions need more uh, development that others are not so um significant in their setting i i don't know if some of these dimensions will disappear as such i mean the framework itself because of this lens uh, francis hood it's not the lens metaphor you can actually give you know foreground place the lens on one particular uh dimension or set of dimensions and kind of you know take away the lens i mean it's up it's up to the use but always taking them all into account um i don't know if we'll add more more dimensions i think they're pretty this was a discussion that we held years ago back in finland when uh, ute and i were working together on this for example the dimension culture some people said but culture is not there when i disagree culture is everywhere culture is everywhere you know culture is in, in academic disciplines or different academic cultures, in agents, agents are based in a particular cultural model, in practices and processes, cultural, it, in, you know, it permeates absolutely everything. So, um, you know, there was a discussion of, you know, how many dimensions could we add, should we add? Um, as, as far as I see it, you know, um, I, I don't think these dimensions will disappear but they they probably re receive more or less attention and then other dimensions added it would be interesting to see why not i think they're broad enough to actually um to actually um adopt or adapt uh 
various areas, for example, online teaching and learning in practices and processes is something that we have not just, um, developed so far. And, and I truly believe it would be very, very interesting. Thank, thanks, Emma. I, I, just while we're on that topic, I mean, I've got two questions from KBJ Haynes and Mario, but I'm going to ask the question that Min Wee Wee is, uh, Min Wee Wei has just posted, and I'll read it out because it's on the topic of what you've just been discussing. And they say, thanks for your insightful talk. I have a question regarding the framework. In practice, the background of each cohort of students within the same program might be different. For instance, when the group have a dominating L, a dominating L1, yeah. for example, the discussion, work of group, project, etc., between students might be different from that when the group is composed of students with varied L1 backgrounds. Exactly. So I want to know the question is: in what sense will the framework be able to accommodate such internal difference? Well, I think that, um, yeah, I mean, and, and there are interesting studies that have already, um, you know, discussed that or reflected that. That's a work by Mia Komori Glatz in Austria. She actually um, completed her uh, PhD uh, dissertation uh, using road mapping. And she's actually comparing group work, which is it's one of the few studies, at least that I know of, that actually uses road mapping to describe um, student group work very, very interesting. And she actually looks at, you know, how these micro um, microcosmos within the classroom actually develop different strategies. So I, I think under the, the, the bigger dimension of agents, of course, you can actually nest different um, interpretations and uses of, of roles of English, that would be a very interesting way of doing doing it. For example, teaching formats, uh, you know, uh, group work versus uh, whole class discussion versus, and of course, the roles of English and other languages in those particular teaching formats are going to change tremendously. And I think road mapping can do that very clearly because the, 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 the dimension agents and students within that can actually do that, can adapt to that very, very well. Okay, and David's just asked if you could put the name of the group work researcher in the chat, please. So we'll 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 do that. Um, uh, David, I'll try to do everything at the same time. But yeah, I promise. I'll, I'll otherwise, if not, I'll send it off. I'll do it at the end. Yes, absolutely. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I wouldn't be. Able, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to multitasking. Multitasking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I'm going to go back to, to a question from KBJ Haynes, which um, was really more of a, not so much a question, but a, a comment really, that it was interesting to see that Aries' work on domain loss is still being cited. And it was really to ask if, if you're aware that there's been any, has any more research been done into that more recently? Okay, thank you, Kevin. That's Kevin, Kevin Haynes. We work together in, in, uh, in a number of international projects. Hello, Hello, Kevin. Hello. Um, yes, I. Um, yes, there are. Yes, there are. Um, I haven't quoted them, but I, I know that there are some of them because there is there is, uh, you know, great concern on on domain loss, even in my own setting, even I even I see it. OK, so I'm I haven't quoted um, more updated research, but I, I do know that there are there is. I would have to look it up off the top of my head. I, I cannot. I cannot remember, but there is, uh, you know, concern about this, and and um, I share it too. I share it too. Yeah. Okay, Mario um, uh, made a comment a, a, a long time ago, which I'm only getting to now. Sorry about that, Mario. Um, <clears throat> it's from the South American perspective, and he wants to know, in your opinion, um, what's the future of EMI stroke EME in um, what he calls emerging Latin American contexts. The future, meaning if it's going to spread any further, if if research, meaning... I'm not quite sure, Mario, if you want to, to make a comment or or, um, or or speak even if Jim... Is it going to grow, I guess? Is it, is I, I it spreading? That really was what, was what um, he was asking about. He yeah. says yes, yes, okay. Uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, um, well, I mean, um, all indicators would suggest yes, would suggest yes that there is... Um, you know, growth, we know we've seen it in Brazil. I've actually started reading uh, publications that actually look at all this in Brazil. 
Um, I, I think so. I know that there are other other settings in in Argentina. Um, I think there is um, there have been initiatives at a, what we call in in private universities, for example. In Colombia, I remember reading Universidad del Norte that actually, and I think it's spreading more into the um, public, non-private universities um, at different rhythms and different um, scales. But I think that it is going to grow, um, and and we have we have um, you know indications that this will happen. The interesting thing would be to accompany this uh, research and these um, initiatives. In a, in a kind of structured uh, way to support them, to, to kind of do it well, because some of the, not only in Latin America and many settings, my setting, you know, some of the decisions that were taken were definitely not um, well planned in a way, I think. Uh, thanks. Uh, I think Sarah had a question about the subject of growth, really, whether or not you thought that Imimus would replace um, EMI as a way of talking about about what we're what we're what we're talking about now, for example. Oh, I would love that to happen. <laughs> um, I I would like that to happen in the sense that I mean um, the name itself is already reflecting, you know, a, a whole understanding, a stance. So we're looking at multilingual university settings. I, I the term EMI is missing half the story. I mean, it doesn't talk about university. It doesn't talk about education. Um, so I would really think that it's it's much more um, appropriate to use the term emimus, um, you know, to to refer to this. But who knows? I mean, we'll we'll have to see. But I think it's 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 much more appropriate to refer, or at least the way we understand this reality, it should be. Mm -hmm. I've got someone got a got a raised hand here, and um, Hind and um, Mashra has raised their hand. Um, Hind, are you do? do can you actually address Emma directly? Jim, is that possible? It is not. <laughs> okay. it oh. would take me, yeah, it would take me a while to change the settings. Um, not to worry. Hind, if you want to write your question in the chat, um, ah, they're unable to open the mic. Um, right. Let's see, if you can write your, your, your question, Hind, that would be brilliant. Um, meanwhile, um, there's a comment from Pam while that's happening. My comment, Pam says, following on from Mario's, um, EME is a rapidly growing market in Asia. Yes. Um, do you yes. expect this situation to spread to South America? And what is your opinion of the use of EMI in other Spanish speaking countries? Okay, what is my opinion? Well, okay. Um, How much time have we got? I mean, I, 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 one of the reasons why we, um, Ute and I back in 2014 started um, discussing this and, and the need to actually provide a framework that could, could be used to, to uh, describe this more carefully than what it was, you know, at the time done as, as good, bad or indifferent, you know, and my experiences at the at my university level, where I had to discuss um, very um, sensitive issues with people that were not linguists, and therefore, you know, language was invisible in all this because you know we were importing international students and we were having some fees. My university is a European university, and therefore, it does not depend. Um, initially on international students like other institutions do. But I mean, I, I do think that, um, you know, maybe one of the issues here has been the scale and the speed at which all this has developed. Sometimes, you know, there's not enough readiness, if you want, you know, for the whole thing. And, and because um, people that work in languages are not consulted, are not part of their, you know, decision making we wish often is uh, you know very very uh, serious decisions are taken without enough um, consensus or even um, you know um, informed um, you know um, principles there so I, I honestly believe that if you know um, English medium education is, is well planned 
uh, been been um, and and well thought of and taking into account these multilingual repertoires and taking into account the intercultural components, I honestly think that it can be um, an opportunity for those that actually want to do it. Um, I mean, but I'm not definitely not defending its, you know, um, unruled, um, uh, you know, expansion throughout the world in in detriment of, you know, local languages and local teaching and learning styles definitely not always in addition to what is already there in combination with but it's not an easy a topic is it i mean we could be here for a long long time okay i can see many comments coming up i don't know if we can keep up john no, i think i think we've managed i think i don't think i've missed anything <clears throat> there was a comment from Ria, but I, I think Jim has dealt with it. And... <laughs> I'm being, I'm, I'm raising arguments in the chat over here. <laughs> All right, okay. Well, shall we really? deal with And Rhea, I can't, and Rhea, I can't Rhea, see Rhea them. Ria Rampersand wanted to know, really, um, about whether or not, um, okay, let me see what the question is. My question is, would you consider teaching English language learners uh, at, in an EMI education context? I'm not quite sure what that question means. Um, uh, Jim suggested mm, that teaching English would be ELT, not EMI. Um, I'm not sure if that deals with Ria's, Ria's question, uh, really. Uh, if you want to make a comment in the chat, Ria, if that, if that, if you, if because you, I think, because the thing for me, because the there's been a couple of things in here too, you know, about the idea of you know, MEMS replacing EMI and then questions about how EMI is understood or defined. I had a couple of um, private messages as well from participants asking about how EMI is defined and, you know, could we potentially replace medium with languages? You know, I think there's a lot of things to consider about EMI and, and Emma, I, I, you know, I am really interested in hearing what you have to say about this because, you know, for me, in my experience, you know, I, I taught EMI taught in an EMI context for many years and my learners were monolingual Japanese speakers. So, yeah. you know, for me, Amimus with its multilingual aspect doesn't apply. And so, you know, this is the part where I, I try to kind of get a good grasp of what it means for English language teaching to be a part of what you're doing alongside it being EMI. You know, so it, it's that it's that balance. No, but you know, it, but it yeah. is but it is um, in the sense that when OK, um, in the introduction, when I said bilingual multilingual. OK, yeah. I mean, we're kind of using it in a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of general, you know, inclusive manner, because we're looking at bilinguals also as, let's say, um, uh, you know, as, as people that use more than one language, okay? Yeah. Um, and then, of course, to, to different degrees, including other multilingual repertoires. But I mean, I mean, amemus, I'm using amemus in a setting that, technically speaking, is bilingual. Yeah. But I mean, we, we, we do include, we come, you know, we have now students, uh, you know, born and raised in Spain that have come, you know, from other heritage contexts. So they speak Romanian or they speak Arabic at home as home languages. So, I mean, I'm thinking about a, a world that is much more multilingual than ever before. Um, even our students that are born and raised in Spanish, like my son, you know, well, my, I'm a mixture myself. But anyway, he is he is actually taking German as a foreign language, third foreign, uh, second foreign language, because they're, you know, they can do so now because their competence in English is good enough to actually include other foreign languages or uh, regional languages. Think about the Catalan speakers or Basque speakers in Spain. So, I mean, I think the multilingual reality is much more extended than we might originally think, okay? And again, by multilingual, I don't mean full competence, balanced competence in all languages, not at all. Right, so I right. think your bilingual speakers in, in Japan would definitely apply. I mean, that is the idea. That makes sense, that makes sense. Well okay. argued. <laughs> Thanks for that, that's, that, that's great. Uh, well, Ria has clarified her question and she says that she's speaking about children whose English language proficiency disadvantages them in an English education context because their L1 is different. Now, I think I know what Emma might say, but if you just want to deal with that, Emma. No, you. what, what do I want to say? I mean, we're talking about higher education. I'm talking about higher education. I mean, in, in Amemus, uh, we're referring to higher education. 
mm, multilingual university settings. And I know what she refers to, and I, I, I you know, I, I share her concern. But I mean, I'm talking about higher education settings, and I we started off by saying that you know there we talk about different uh, learner ages, level of um, you know um, volunteer a voluntary basis at university, and so on and so forth. It's not the same in settings where students have no choice. I'm talking about tertiary settings, uh, which which have very different contextual features. I mean, on, on that point, I think that's interesting what you're saying. I mean, what I find interesting about it, Mimis, Emma, is that I think also students have sometimes no choice in, in higher education settings either. However, I think what- Well, what they I... do have a choice to go to university or not in general. Well, that's what well, I mean. That's well, what I mean by choice. Yeah, but, but I suppose what I find interesting is that, that Imimus um, it does not, I mean, in terms of the, the hegemony of English, which I find problematic, I think yeah. one of the things that, that, that Imimus is doing is allowing students to draw on their multilingual repertoires and that these are not seen as somehow um, problematic things to be present in, in the lecture hall. I mean, that's, that's yes, what I yes. And that, that would take us to internationalization, because I mean, yeah. we're talking about one type of internationalization through English, but you can definitely internationalize students through Spanish. Spanish is an international language, yeah. which is yeah. what we are finding. Yeah. We're finding that we have st Swedish st students that come to Madrid, Complutense, and to in, to in Spanish. I mean, uh, means of instruction. So in a way, as I say, you know, um, Imimus is one way to internationalize, but not the only way at all. Uh, yeah, great. Now, I've just got two questions here. Again, Betul says that this is her first academic seminar after the holidays, and boy, has it been a great start. So that's good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Emma, okay. I've absolutely loved it. Final question is whether Dr. Emma is happy for us to email them for a follow up on their research, and if so, what their email address is. Well, I, I'm sure you'd be happy to have anyone email you, Emma, um, if they've got follow-up questions on your work. Um, yes. And Pam also says, I'd like to be able to follow up on this seminar. Can we get a copy of the presentation? I think, um, uh, Pam, the way it works is this will go onto our YouTube channel, which Jim knows about and can talk about in a much more enlightened way. But yes, that will be available um, for you to look at again, if that's what you want to do. Jim, do you want to just say something about the, the channel? Yeah. Yeah, no, I can. Yeah, I um, actually, yeah, if somebody could put a link to it, Nathan, if you're there, you're, you're good at that. <laughs> put a link to the YouTube channel in the chat. Um, I know you didn't ask me, Jim. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so all of the requests for things like reference lists or, or, you know, copies of the slides, what you can do is just kind of review that in the recording, which will be posted on YouTube. Um, it'll come through to me on the cloud and I'll, I'll share that to the YouTube channel. Um, yeah, within the next 24 hours. Exactly, Mario. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just putting in that information. I think David, I don't know if David uh, Perfume is still there, but this is the Mia Komori. Uh, that's right. Komori is a Y. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. On group work in EME. Yeah, that's what. That's her. Okay, there you go. But I can send you the, I can put you in touch with Mia, who's actually done a fabulous job with, and, and she's actually extended some of the ideas of of road mapping, I mean, because as, as we, we, you know, these things, the interesting thing is that people use them to understand their own reality and rather, you know, there's there's nothing written in, in stone, definitely not. And it's quite interesting to see how people are using it in a, in a kind of, you know, creative way, we might say. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, I think that might be it, really. Um, people are now just saying thank you. Oh, no, Michael's come in. He says a bit late, but I had a question. Um, let's go for it, because we've got a couple of minutes left. We've got about four minutes left. I'll just read it aloud here, Emma. He says, I have mm -hmm. a question. Ernesto Macaro considers language policy at HE institutions as a significant factor in the conceptualization of EMI, i.e. no policy decisions to teach through English in Anglophone countries. How does Imimus reflect on the language policy difference, differences between Anglophone and non-Anglophone HEIs and their differences? Yeah, that's very interesting, isn't it? But we have a paper in the special issue, don't we, John, by Sean Priest yes, that is actually do. touching upon that topic because 
uh, if you remember at the beginning, we actually, I actually said that EMI is generally understood as happening in non-Anglophone countries, but John and I have hold, held discussions on this. And, you know, we understand, we, we agree now that Mimas is actually happening in Anglophone settings too. And of course, it's, it's probably been overlooked or in, in, in the past, and it's very, a very interesting site for, for research. So I, I totally agree that, you know, it's very interesting to compare the policy and, and Sean has this paper that actually looks at UCL and the policies at UC, uh, UCL. So I think this would be a very interesting avenue for, for research in, in the future and how this might have an impact you know, these um, in, in, in the policies that are developed in these Anglophone settings where language is, language is invisible because it's everywhere, it's in motion. So I think that would be very interesting, a very interesting, um, uh, you know, source of uh, re site for research, definitely. Well, that's great. Thank you, Emma, very much indeed for that um, uh, really stimulating and very well received talk. Um, it was an absolute pleasure to be able to introduce you. Um, Thank you. So, uh, I think what will happen now is we'll, we'll all just say goodbye and eventually this will appear on the YouTube channel, maybe uh, in about 24 hours or so. Um, thanks, Jim, for- No, for no editing, no editing. Jim, and, no editing. And, and <laughs> if you like, let me know. <laughs> and thanks everybody for, for, for coming and for all your interesting questions and comments in the chat. Thank you very much. That was very, very interesting. Thank you everybody for those questions. Makes, always makes me think. Okay, thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely, thank you.